with our moderator today. So um, Dr. Uh, Lucia Lee is um, uh, at the Imperial College of London and she will be introducing our talk today. So thank you, Lucia. Great, thank you very much, Adam. And um, thank you to Adam and David for this fantastic series. Um, it's really brightened up my lockdown. I <laughs> hope it's brightened up everyone else's as well. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Inga Kutta who is Professor of Neurobiological Research in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at LMU in Munich, but also has a dual appointment with Harvard in the US. For those of you not already familiar with her work, Professor Kurta has published a number of very important studies linking concussive and subconcussive impacts with structural changes in the brain, um, with work covering the range of um, modalities and methodologies from animal models of TBI right through to some of the most vulnerable populations in TBI, such as adolescents. Some of her current projects include NIH and ERC funded studies of the sex differences following TBI, which I think we'll all agree is a very important emerging field. The impact of her work is reflected not only in her vast volume of publications and chapters, but perhaps most impressively in its real world translation. Her research and advocacy have led to both the UEFA and US soccer to change their rules about heading in youth football. And in addition to her research activities, Prof Kurta holds a number of um, substantial leadership positions in the field, including Vice President of the European Neurotrauma Organization and coordinator of the Euronet and Consortium. It's perhaps unsurprising then that Professor Kurt has been the recipient of numerous prizes for both her mentorship and her research, and um, most recently the recipient of the Princess and Therese von Bayen Prize, which is awarded only every three years to outstanding women scientists whose careers can serve as an example to others. So I'm sure you're all as excited as I am to hear Professor Kurt present today on effects of repetitive head impacts. Over to you, Inga. Thank you, Lucia. This is a very kind introduction. Thank you, Adam and David, for setting up this wonderful series of uh, presentations in the field of neurotrauma. I'm going to share my slides. Um, I'm very excited to talk today about the effects of repetitive head impacts, um, and I'm going to focus mostly on the effects of repetitive head impacts in the context of sport and within sports, mostly on American football, ice hockey, as well as soccer um, that we also call football over here in Europe. Um, so it seems like that there is not a single week going by where there's not at least one headline in the media about the potential damaging effects of having a ball in soccer or being exposed to repetitive head impacts and uh, the potential association with brain damage and also the increased risk uh, for developing dementia. And some say that heading the ball in soccer may be bad for young brains and some experts even call for a ban of heading the ball in soccer completely. And it was in 2015 when US soccer banned heading for children at the age of 10 and under, and just last year, UK followed with a similar regulation. So what's behind all of this? If we take a um, close look at the literature, which Alex Tarnertz did in his um, systematic review in 2017, he identified a rather small number of only 30 studies that systematically looked at the effects of the persistent effects of um, playing um, football and especially the effects of being exposed to repetitive head impacts um, by, for example, heading the ball. And most of the studies that he found were, of, were based on very small sample sizes and they were of cross-sectional nature. Um, and the conclusion of this systematic review was that we don't really know. We do not really know whether there are any persistent effects of heading the ball in soccer on the brain. So there's a clear mismatch between what's out there in the media and what's actually there in the literature backing this up. Um, so my talk is going to focus on two um, agenda points. One is what do we actually know about the effects of repetitive head impacts? And second, and probably most important, um, what do we want to know? So what do we know? We know that Anne McKee, who gave a presentation in the same format about two months ago, um, is a neuropathologist at Boston University. She examined 111 brains of NFL players, and in 110 out of those 111, she found signs of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. 
CTE is a neurodegenerative disease. It is a post-mortem diagnosis only. You need to cut open the brain to make the diagnosis. And what you do see is when you do this is that um, there is a deposition of hyperphosphorylated tau, especially in neurons and astrocytes, and um, particularly in the depths of the cerebral cell size. So I hope you see my cursor here. This is the depth of the cells, for the cells, for example, or here you can also see it over here um, or over here where you see those um, brown stains that are um, hyperphosphorylated, uh, it's a hyperphosphorylated tau. Um, and studies have shown that um, there is an association between exposure to repetitive fat impacts and the development of CTE. But it seems like there is much more at play. There are more factors here that we may or may not even know yet. Um, that also lead and increase the risk for CTE. So it is repetitive head impact, but probably also a number of other factors that play a role. So from another perspective, from an epidemiology perspective, this is a work from uh, my colleague, Willie Stewart from Glasgow. And um, he looked at um, a big database um, and looked at the um, reason why people passed away and also the time when they passed away. And he compared a large group of um, 7,600 professional soccer players um, and compared them to a huge group of 23,000 um, uh, controls in the normal population. And interestingly saw that uh, soccer players had a less, lesser risk to pass away in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And then this switches when at the age of 70, the soccer players are more likely to pass away. And when you take a look at the right, there is an indicator that um, there are differences in the reason for passing away. So you see that they have a lower risk um, to die from ischemic heart disease. They have a lower risk to die from lung cancer. Um, however, they have a higher risk to die from neurodegenerative diseases. So taken together from the neuropathology perspective as well as from the epidemiology perspective, we know that those exposed to repetitive head impacts have a higher likelihood to develop neurodegenerative diseases and also pass away from neurodegenerative diseases in general, but most likely also from CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So we really do need to know what's going on while those players are still alive to be able to diagnose and hopefully also um, provide um, targeted treatment so that they um, to ultimately prevent the development of neurodegenerative diseases. So before we dive into this, we need to get um, uh, the terminology straight. We know that traumatic brain injury is um, categorized in mild, moderate, and severe based on the initial symptom presentation based on the Glasgow Coma Scale. And then there is concussion, which is often used as a synonym, especially in the context, uh, in the context of sports. It's probably also on the mildest spectrum of mild TBI. And then there's something that's called subconcussive head impacts. And um, those are defined as not eliciting any acute symptoms, but are, as I said, um, 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 there's indication that um, they lead to cumulated effects over time and may increase the risk for the development of a neurodegenerative disease. I want you to take a close look at this um, overly simplified scheme that Alex Lynn, my colleague in Boston and I came up a while ago um, and to disentangle the timeline um, of um, mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, repetitive head impacts and then chronic or new degeneration. So um, there is an acute stage where you could have a decrease in quality of life when you sustain an impact and you have symptoms or as indicated with the dotted line over here, you may not even have any acute symptoms. And then there's a chronic state where you could potentially have chronic symptoms. And oftentimes people report, for example, um, post-traumatic uh, um, headaches or trouble concentrating or sleep disturbances. And then there is probably a smaller subgroup that will develop a neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disorder later in life. And what's important to note is, is that just because you had a uh, concussion or were exposed to repetitive head impacts, and even if that happened multiple times during your life, does not mean that you are um, going to experience any chronic symptoms. Um, and it also does not mean that you necessarily develop a neurodegenerative disease. And on the other hand, just because you had 
for example, chronic symptoms does not mean that those will progress over time. And importantly also, just because you did not have any symptoms here in the acute and chronic state, um, you could um, nevertheless develop a neurodegenerative disease. And I want you to keep this in mind when you read studies, because oftentimes I feel like they're mixing all of this together. Um, when you review studies or papers, when you plan studies, um, and then also in case you're involved in patient care, when you, when you sit um, across the room from your patient, so that we really disentangle those different entities, um, which may or may not be related. And this is something that we need to investigate further. This study um, was very eye-opening to me when I saw it the first time. Um, it is a computer model that looked at um, the stress and the forces that apply when you sustain an impact. And the upper row here is based on the idea that you have a straight impact um, to the head. For example, this is a fall from a high height um, on the ground. Um, and what you can see is this, that there's a lot of stress to the bony portion of you had the skull, but there's not as much strain uh, to the brain. However, when this computer model looked at different angles and less straight, but more, you know, subtle or indirect um, hits to the head, um, in addition to a um, rotational force, then the skull was not able to prevent or take away the stress that appeared, but actually gave it further to the inside of the skull. And you can see that the brain tissue itself um, experienced much more stress than compared to the upper row. And that leads to diffuse actual injury that we oftentimes see in mild traumatic brain injury. And so if you um, consider um, how most of the impacts happen in sports, such as here in boxing, um, you now realize that you may not need to hit a wall to actually cause strain to your brain tissue, that even an acceleration and deceleration um, could lead to uh, shear strain of your brain tissue. And I think this becomes really clear from this very neat um, video that I found in the, in the internet. Um, where you see that a slight impact to the skull leads to a considerable mo motion of um, the brain tissue. And then when you take a look at, um, um, when you take a look, close look at the brain tissue, this is where you often see injury. And this has also been um, backed up by computer models where you see that especially the an intersection between gray matter and white matter because of the differences in the, in the characteristics of the tissue is very likely to be uh, highly vulnerable to shear um, stress and it could lead to um, you know, shearing of the um, axons. Um, it could lead to a stretch, to a tears, but also to a complete interruption of the axon. And this is how a normal axon looks like when you look at it under fluorescent micro microscopy. So this nice green light is, is an axon. And this is how it looks like after shear deformation has been or shear force has been applied. And um, you see those bulbs um, along the axon and this also gave it the name beating of an axon. And when you would um, take a close look at those bulbs, then you see that um, there is microglia act uh, um, activation, there could be an interruption of the transport of the axon and, and certainly an interruption of the function of this axon. Um, and this could be even without a complete shear of the axon. So taken together, I think it's very important to note that um, you may not need uh, strong forces to cause brain tissue damage. And that's why it's very important that we um, don't say that um, subconcussive um, head impacts don't cause brain injury. They may as well cause brain injury or brain tissue injury. Here's another um, close look at what might be happening. And this is um, a study that showed that there's also a decrease in dendrites. So there are more dendrites here than there are here. And that there's also a difference in the excitability of the neuron. So what do we want to know? We want to know whether there are acute effects of repetitive head impacts. 
We also want to know what is the time course of brain alterations that occur after being exposed to repetitive head impacts. We want to know if there are sex specific differences. Um, and we want to know if there is a dose response curve, meaning that those who get exposed more more often or with more force, are they more likely to develop um, brain injury or um, long-term consequences? We also want to know what is the effect on brain development because most of the cohorts that we're actually studying are um, children and adolescents and they're well in the middle of their brain development. And um, as indicated before, we also want to know what are other risk factors for developing chronic sacrilege other than exposure to repetitive head impacts. And this is where we clearly need you. Um, where there are so many important questions that need to be systematically studied and um, it is impossible to do this on our own. Here's the study that we did on youth soccer players. We had them do a very quick cognitive test um, developed by my colleague Anne Serino. Um, and this is called the ProPoint uh, test, and this is called the AntiPoint test. It is being performed on an iPad. And we had the youth soccer players perform this test right before um, the training session and right after the training session. And this test is very easy. You put your finger in the middle, and then the square lights up, and you're supposed to press the square that light, lights up as quickly as you can. This one gets a little bit more complex. You put your finger in the middle, the square lights up, and you're supposed to click the opposite square. So you need to do some thinking. Um, so we had to do the soccer players and also control group that is not exposed to repetitive head impact. Do this test before the training session and after the training session. What you can see is, is that um, everyone, all the players, um, also the controls got better between pre-training and after training. So this was statistically significant for both the control soccer players. And this was true not only for the pro point test, but also for the more complex anti-point test. And this is not um, surprising to everyone who studies athletes. Um, sport is actually good. We get better with training. There's more blood flowing to our brain. Um, however, um, when we investigated both groups for a longer period of time over the course of a play season, we saw that the control group got better and better and better. And they're here in blue for the pro point test. The same is true for the anti point test. They got faster and faster. So response time declined um, in both tests. And the soccer players got slightly better. Um, but um, not nearly as much as the control group um, 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 improved over time. So this um, is an indication that there could be an association between the exposure to repetitive uh, head impact in the one group and a lack of improvement in cognitive performance in youth athletes. And mind you, those are um, 14 to 16 year old uh, soccer players, so they are supposed to learn. Their brain should be, you know, learning every day. Um, and then this is an information that is not displayed here in the figure, but in the paper is that those who played more long headers, so those over a longer distance with more impact and more force, they were the ones that showed the slowest improvement in reaction time. And this is a first sign that there could be a dose response curve so that those who are exposed to more force are those who learn less over the uh, period of um, a season. So um, we, we want to know with, um, uh, what, what is really going on in the brain and in the living athlete. Uh, what, one thing that we can do and that we're applying, my group in Munich and Boston is applying, but also other groups around the world are a set of advanced neuroimaging techniques. And with advanced neuroimaging using MRI, we can actually um, study um, a whole bunch of things. We can do volumetrics, we can look at cortical thickness, we can um, look at the connection between different regions in the brain using tryptography or connectomics. We can look at the function of the brain, at the biochemistry or metabolism of the brain. And uh, by piecing those information together, uh, we get a better picture of what is going on in the brain that is exposed to repetitive head impacts.
One of the techniques that we're using very often, and I'm sure has come up in other talks as well that you've heard about traumatic brain injury is diffusion tensor imaging. Um, and this is based on the diffusion and the measurement of diffusion of water molecule, mole, molecules in every voxel, in every element of the um, picture, we measure the motion of uh, the diffusion of water molecules, we can then calculate um, uh, how much diffusion is there, and if this diffusion is directed in a particular direction, if we piece those together, then we can actually follow tracts in the brain. We can get those very pretty pictures where we follow tracts really until the gray matter boundary. And then we can also combine this information and calculate connectomics where we look at the likelihood that regions are connected to each other and communicating. We used um, diffusion tensor imaging in a study on um, youth soccer players. Um, they were um, yeah, at, at around um, early college age. And um, we um, compared them through a group of swimmers in this case. This is a very small study. It was done pretty early when we started looking at the effects of repetitive head impacts in 2011 and 2012. And what we found was that the soccer players had widespread um, alterations of diffusion metrics, and here this is the plate, this plate radial diffusivity, but it was also true for other diffusion um, parameters compared to the control group. Um, and this was found in both hemispheres across the brain, large areas that were significantly different, indicating that there are microstructural differences um, in those um, soccer players. We also then looked at specific tracts and were able to um, um, in, um, um, confirm those findings in specific tracts that have also been shown to be impacted by malgeomatic brain injury and um, especially the corpus callosum, proto-spinal tract and the single limb bundle. The question then was, um, how long do those changes actually persist? Are they there all the time? Is there, um, you know, is there a time course? And we did a study in ice hockey players that we investigated before the season, that was preseason, and then after the season. And um, here we um, were not surprised to see that those three who had sustained a concussion throughout um, the season, and they're here marked in red, that they had an increase in diffusion measures. We knew even at that time in 2012 from many studies in mild traumatic brain injury that this was to be expected. However, we were surprised to see that so many of the other ice hockey players who did not have a concussion, and I have to say that every single game in this study was observed by a, a sports medicine physician. So we truly know that they did not have a concussion and that so many others had also an increase in diffusion measures over time. Um, we wanted to know what happens after the end of the season. And in this study, we investigated American football players, also college level. And um, here we saw um, an increase again in diffusion measures between preseason and postseason, and um, from the previous study, we were not surprised to see that it was actually something that we expected. And then it was very interesting to see that most of those players actually went back to a uh, their personal baseline after a period of non-contact rest. We were able to investigate them six months after the end of the season where they were not exposed to repetitive head impacts. They were participating in sports, but not in contact sports, and there was no head impact exposure. So that was very interesting to see that there might be a chance for the brain to go back to um, personal baseline. And um, what's important to note here is that we also had an indicator for a dose response curve because those who had the highest impacts um, were those who had the most, um, most pronounced changes in diffusion measures. And those were also the ones who did not reach their personal baseline after this period of six months rest. We had the uh, impact measurements in the study from their helmets because those were American football players. Um, so there is, um, from this study, um, hope that there could be partial recovery um, if the player rests after being exposed to repetitive head impacts. Um, we then started a large study here in Europe funded by Aeronaut Neuron. The study is called Rep Impact, and there are six teams across Europe involved in this, and three of those teams are requiring data. So we're requiring data in Germany and Norway and in Belgium, 
And then there are three more teams that contribute their expertise in um, advanced neuroimaging and um, also in uh, neuroimmunology and blood biomarkers. So we have a chance to have a very comprehensive approach and to take a look at the brain from every possible perspective in the study. Um, I wished I already have results that I could present to you, but you have to stay tuned because we're in the middle of running analysis and um, we'll present more throughout this year. Um, in a study on um, former professional soccer players um, that we investigated after they had already finished their competitive um, career, um, they were still participating in recreational soccer, which oftentimes happens in, in former professional soccer players, so they're meeting up once a week. But as I said, not professionally anymore. We um, looked at um, potential long-term consequences of participating in soccer. And here we looked at their cortical thickness and compared them to a group of also former competitive athletes that were not part of or not participating in a contact sport. And we saw here that the cortical thickness in the control group slightly declined with increasing age. And that is something that has been um, often described in the literature on aging, that over time we lose um, some of the cortical thickness in our brain. And so this result is well within what's to be expected with increasing age at this age range. However, when we looked at the soccer players, it was surprising how steep their decline was in cortical thickness. Please note that when I say um, decline, that this is a study that is cross-sectional, so we cannot, we did not follow them over those many decades, but we were only able to sort them based on their age here. And what's also interesting is that um, we had one goalkeeper that is indicated here with a triangle, and this goalkeeper keeper was um, rather in the middle of the control group and not following the line of the soccer players, and goalkeepers are not exposed to the number of repetitive head impacts as are the other teammates. And then interestingly, those uh, here indicated with a box were the ones that had um, the highest cumulative exposure to repetitive head impacts throughout their career. And they were on the lower end of cortical thickness um, for each of the compared to um, players at similar age. So I think that's, that's very important um, to see. And it's, um, of course, it's a small, sample study, so it needs to be replicated in a larger sample, but it could be um, a sign of accelerated aging in those exposed to repetitive head impact. And um, those who are familiar with the literature on MTBI, accelerated aging has also been um, discussed there as a potential long-term effect of um, myotraumatic brain injury. In the same sample, we were able to look um, uh, a little deeper into what might be causing this decline in cortical thickness. And um, Alex Lin investigated um, using MR spectroscopy, the metabolism of the cortical, um, of the cortex and also the white matter in the study. And um, it was interesting to see that um, there was an increased colon, which is a membrane marker and an increased myonositol, which is a glial cell um, marker. Um, that both measures were increased in the former professional soccer players compared to the control group. And that again, the increase in those parameters was um, correlated with the accumulative exposure to repetitive head impacts in their careers. So that might be an idea, give, might give us an idea of what, what, what might be going on, why there's a decrease in cortical thickness because both markers are um, markers of neuroinflammation. So there might be chronic neuroinflammatory processes going on that might lead to a decrease in cortical thickness in those players. Um, and um, this is um, um, along the same lines with regard to chronic effects. Um, I mentioned this earlier on that in American football players, we um, know about these reports of a chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And um, I showed you with the computer model that especially in the gray matter, white matter boundary, we expect shear injury. And so that fits very, very well with where we actually see 
um, the um, deposition of the hyperphosphorylated tau. So that is an area of interest to us, which is why we're currently looking at this um, gray matter, white matter boundary in detail in both former NFL players, former professional American football players, as well as in soccer players exposed to repetitive head impacts. So um, one of the questions that is very important uh, to us and is part of um, or in the center of two of my studies is what are the sex specific differences um, with regard to the effects of repetitive head impacts? And before we go into the sex, dif sex differences of the effect, we need to um, appreciate that there are also differences uh, to begin with. So there are differences in the exposure. We know that males had the ball way more often than females. And this has now been studied and published also recently in different samples. So not just in adults, but also in uh, children and in youth athletes across different ages. We also know that females um, sustain higher accelerations when they have the ball um, and that they have weaker neck strength, which then in combination also leads to more motion of their brain inside the skull. Um, and this is a recent study from um, Stian Sandmo from also who was part of the rep impact study where you clearly see this also in this cohort girls are uh, here in black and boys are in gray, where you see that across all age ranges, you see um, the males heading the ball more often. Um, and then we also need to appreciate that there are difference in the brain structure to begin with. Um, we know that there are differences in brain volume. Um, we know that males have larger brains than females. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated when we talk about gray matter because there are areas where males have more gray matter and then there are other areas where females have more gray matter. Um, but we also know that there are differences to begin with in white, white matter. And again, it's a little bit more complicated than just volume. There are, are again, some of the tracts are more pronounced in females and some of the tracts are more pronounced in males. Um, and this is a very important study that Doug Smith and his group at UPenn published just um, a couple of years ago. They took um, the axons of um, humans and they compared females to males and they saw that um, the female axon is much smaller in diameter compared to the male axon. And importantly, when they um, stretched those axons, um, they actually saw that the female axon um, ruptured more easily um, compared to the male axon. So it is not just structural difference, but there's also a functional difference here in those axons, which may put females at an increased risk um, for sustaining those shear injury um, uh, when they're, when they're um, exposed to repetitive head impacts or mild TBI. Um, and then <clears throat> there are also differences in connectivity that we have to take into account. Um, we know that males have an in increased structural connectivity in networks that are dedicated to motor, sensory, and executive functions. Um, and um, those are interestingly oftentimes um, in the same hemisphere. Um, and um, here. And then we know that females have higher connectivity in um, networks that are important for social motivation, attention, and memory. And importantly, those networks are oftentimes interhemispheric, meaning that they're, they're across um, the corpus callosum and um, connecting areas in the left side of the brain with the right and vice versa. So when you um, remember um, the um, initial one of the initial slides where I showed that especially the center of the brain is often very um, in computer models shows up as very vulnerable and also taken together with the literature that we know on mild traumatic brain injury where we see most of the changes in the center of the brain such as the corpus callosum then you may appreciate now that even if females and males sustain the same type of impact with the same force that leading to the same type of shear injury, that it may elicit different symptoms in males than in females because 
females may relate, rely more on interhemispheric communication within their brain compared to males that may be less uh, depending on this interhemispheric communication. Um, so there, just to add another piece of complexity, um, those of you who are studying children and adolescents know that, and young adults as well, know that the brain is developing way into the um, uh, age of um, 20, 25 years of age. And um, importantly, this is not the same across the entire brain. There are differences for different, for, for different tracts. And to make it even more complicated, this is also different for males and females. So I think when we study sex differences, we need to be very careful that we take those existing, pre-existing differences such as structural, functional, and also with regard to the microstructure of the axons into account when we study um, those differences systematically and also when we interpret our findings. And we also need to take into account that in different places in the brain, this might be different. Um, currently, there are very, very few studies focusing on the sex differences in um, those exposed to repetitive head impacts. This is one from my, from my group, Nico Solman, um, looked at the differences um, between females and males exposed to repetitive head impacts throughout a season of ice hockey. And he found that um, females were more likely to develop changes between preseason and postseason and also in larger areas than males. So both um, increase in size and as well as increase in, um, in the dynamic or intensity of changes in the brain. We do not know what those changes really mean, but I think it's important to, see it to, to take this into consideration and to systematically look for those differences and not just account for age, uh, sorry, that not just to account for um, sex in those studies as we account for age. This is another study from Michael Lipton's group in New York, um, where they're also comparing um, females and males. This is a group of soccer players. And similarly to what we found in the ice hockey players, um, there are more regions. Here is in the middle is uh, females, more regions where we see changes over time compared to what we see in males. And then also there's more intensity and change um, in those regions compared to males. So again, an indicator that female brain might be more vulnerable to shear injury um, after repetitive head impact. So in summary, um, we have uh, a number of studies based on small sample sizes, often in cross-sectional nature, uh, looking from different perspectives and different cohorts of athletes exposed to repetitive head impact. And um, some of those studies point in the direction that there are alterations in brain structure and function um, in those uh, exposed to repetitive head impacts. However, and I think this is very important to know that most of our questions are still unsolved or there is data out there that is inconclusive or, um, um, yeah, as I said, only explaining a part of um, the truth. And there are very few comprehensive studies at the moment. So what's clearly needed is prospective and longitudinal studies that apply a comprehensive approach look from different perspectives, collect a number of um, important data. And um, of course, and this is where I'm biased, I think all of those studies should at least include the basics of neuroimaging. Uh, and with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I also want to thank, thank my team as always. Um, all of this is based on tremendous amount of work of um, students and postdocs and my wonderful collaborators um, uh, all around the world. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a virtual uh, round of applause, which I'm sure everyone else is doing as well. Um, that's great. Look, there's quite a few questions, but I wondered if I could slip one in um, of my own. What is the evidence from either your work or um, the work at large for this idea of a continuum of damage? You know, do we have evidence that there, it is a continuum, i.e. You know, 50 subconcussive is the same as 10 concussive is the same as one really bad one? Or is there evidence the other way around so that actually subconcussive hits and maybe concussive hits are their own separate pathological entity? 
That is, that is a terrific question. Um, it is one of the questions that we're looking at in every single sample where we collect information about the number of sustained concussions, the symptoms that they had, the time that they needed to recover, as well as, on the other hand, collecting systematic information on the exposure to repetitive head impact to try to disentangle this and see if one actually adds to the other or if they're really completely different things. What I can tell you from our studies on the NFL players, this is basically um, mostly detect Detect has been in, it was an NINDS funded study, but former NFL players um, led by Bob Stern at the Boston University is that um, we see a very consistent association between exposure to repetitive head impacts, no matter the measure you pick. But we do not see any association with the number of sustained symptomatic concussions. So from, at least from this study, um, it seems like that those are two different entities. However, we also know from behavioral studies that those who, for example, um, had the ball more often are also more involved in collision with other players and then are more likely to also sustain concussions. So it's not so easy to just disentangle the two completely because there are, um, you know, um, you know, there are differences in um, style of playing, for example, behind us or position in the field and so forth. Great. Well, thank you very much. I better move on to other questions rather than hog all of your attention. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with one of the later ones because it's, it's a bit more relevant as a follow on. Um, Ramesh asks, there's a body of lit literature that suggests that American football players show greater deficits if they started playing earlier in life. And does the same idea exist for, co uh, for soccer? In the past five years, US soccer has recommended, based on your, your work, that heading the ball should not be before the age of 11. Um, so have any stud recent studies evaluated the effect of this change um, in the in youths who have had who have been there since? Yeah, very important question. Um, so uh, what we know from our studies in NFL players, um, this is also, as I said, heavily based on the tech so far, is that those who started to play football before the age of 12 were more likely to um, see, you know, to start with symptoms earlier and also to um, show more um, brain alterations in neuroimaging, for example. <clears throat> and so there are a few studies out there that indicate that before 12 is worse than after 12 for American football. For soccer, it is not as easy because first of all, soccer players usually start to play way earlier. So oftentimes already in elementary school age. So um, most of our soccer players started at the age of five or six, um, the latest at seven. So it is way earlier and their comparison between before 12 and after 12 does not um, you know, does not apply here. Um, <clears throat> and so there's also less um, variability in when they start to play soccer. So that also makes it more difficult to, um, to distinguish uh, subtle, subtle changes um, between, between um, or, or, you know, uh, association between starting earlier because there are no clear differences in age. Um, in in rep impact in the current soccer study, we are actually looking at this explicitly. We're also looking at exposure to contact sports um, in general, but also when they started to play soccer. And as I said, please stay tuned. We're looking into this, we're reporting this, but it's not out there yet. And I can't tell anything about this today. Um, what um, I also want to say is, is that in soccer, which is different than American football, our studies, um, one of the studies that I showed actually indicated that um, soccer players before the age of 14 very rarely had the ball. It really starts at the age of 14 is when they're also systematically trained to have the ball. So I think that's also a difference to take into account that before the age of 14, there is not much going on and they basically had the ball um, occasionally and during a match. So my concern with the um, ban is, is that um, it's actually not really hitting the target because we're banning soccer, uh, we're banning heading for a group that is less likely to have the ball to begin with. And then by putting in this ban with a certain age range, we could potentially apply that it's safe to have the ball after you your turn 11, which is not the case because most of the study that I, that I showed today were in those uh, who were adolescents or young adults. Um, that, that's great. And, and sort of following a couple of questions following on from that, from uh, which I'm going to roll into the same question from Robert and Nathan, 
Um, they've asked uh, around this uh, around this kind of idea of what happens after sport and after injury. So, is there evidence, for example, that multiple subconcussive incidents within a short time frame, so lots of headers within one game, are worse than if they were spread out? So, does that influence how much rest we need? And then, following on from that, Nathan um, asking a similar question: What about the rest periods? You know, do we need to um, think about that more? Uh, and maybe to re to help reduce the cumulative effects of these repeated head impacts? Yeah, those are very important questions as they would apply directly to how we train and coach um, soccer players. However, there is currently not much inf information, at least that I know of, that could really help us. And the problem with studying this is just that those who are studying um, the effects of repetitive head impacts in a short period of time are usually in a lap setting, you know, where they apply like a ball machine that hit the head um, 10 times within like five minutes. And then the question arises, is this really, you know, true? Is this close to reality at all? So those studies have been, um, you know, critiqued for that reason, because in a true game, you have maybe you know, in a match, you ha may have the ball once or twice over the period of like twice, 45 minutes. And that is very different to a ball machine in a few minutes. So it's, it's very difficult to study this. Um, we're actually currently running a study to look into the um, effects of those short headers that they play, for example, in, um, in, in drills that are over a very a small distance, say of two to three meters, compared to those long distance headers, where the death also makes a difference. And those um, short headers are played way more often in a shorter uh, period of time and in a higher frequency. Um, but then again, yeah, as I said, those of the effects are most likely to last for weeks and months. And so then a real soccer players goes on to have five more training sessions after you recorded one. And it's very difficult to, to take this um, apart and know, you know, the effect of the first session compared to the cumulative effect. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to just ask a couple of questions around that's not uh, as linked to sports anymore, but in terms of um, a couple of methodology questions, do you have a favorite control sport that you think works well for these studies? Which I think is a very relevant question. It's, it's a very relevant question for everyone who's planning those studies. So I uh, prefer athletes in a control group because we know that there's so many effects of playing a sport. So no couch potatoes, please athletes and then with athletes there are differences in their cardiovascular training level so check does not count for example it needs to be something that is equivalent in um, intensity um, to your group that you're interested in um, so one of the groups that we for example focused on are table tennis players because they run a lot and they have a comparable um, cardiovascular um, training levels than soccer players. Um, and so I think th those are important points to look at. And then um, what would be even better is team sports, because we also know that playing a team sport is very different than playing uh, or participating in an individual, in individual sport, such as swimming, where you compete against yourself and the clock compared to working with the team, because again, that um, shapes your brain in, 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 in a certain way. Um, and some of the studies have now focused on using um, within group analysis, so say you have a group of American football player and then you compare the different um, positions in the field uh, with each other. And I think um, the perfect study would have both the within the group comparison as well as a nicely selected control group. And this control group should um, contain people from different sports so that you're not comparing apples to oranges, but you're actually comparing apples to a group of you know, differently looking apples in the other group. Um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the position. I think there's been a recent paper out by Zimmerman um, et al. who looked at position of um, NFL players and, and regard that. Um, 
Okay, as, a, as another follow up within this sort of, I think this will be the last sports related question. Um, what do you, from David Brody, what would, would you advise contact sport athletes to perform neck strengthening exercises to try and reduce the rotational acceleration potentially during heading and impact? And could this be envisaged in a randomized control trial? Um, I don't, pers I personally do not study neck strength, but I do have a couple of colleagues who are very interested in this and David, I'm, I'm happy to uh, point you to them and they may give you a more qualified answer. I think um, there is, of course, a benefit of practicing, for example, headers um, in soccer, because we know that if you anticipate a ball, you're less likely to have a backslash of your of your uh, of your head. So you're less likely to have this very strong acceleration deceleration trauma. So there is a benefit of this. Um, on the other hand, if you practice neck strength, that oftentimes also goes hand in hand with participating in more headers. And then the question becomes, are you then more likely to head the ball because you feel like your neck strength is better? And that is a question I cannot answer at the moment, but I would be careful with that. Um, great. And so moving on to sort of broader themes within your talk, um, this is an interesting one. Have you seen differences um, in terms of gender between causes of TBI, so sports versus car accidents versus military versus intimate partner violence? Um, we have not done yet a study where we compare this across different cohorts. Um, but what we have seen so far in specific cohorts that we see um, a tendency towards more vulnerability in females with a tendency to report more symptoms, um, more severe symptoms, taking longer to recover after concussion, and also showing more signs of brain alterations or neuroimaging. Um, but um, we actually just published um, a extensive review article on this last year. So for everyone interested in this, um, findings are not really straightforward when you summarize the literature. And there are also many studies who have not, that have not found any um, difference between um, females and males. I think there's also uh, likely a big reporting bias because females tend to be more uh, open when it comes to reporting their symptoms and speaking honestly about also symptoms they may be difficult to express such as emotional disturbances. And while um, men are more likely to express somatic symptoms such as headaches, so there's an, there are a number of important factors to take into account. I do not know of any study that compared this across um, at different sports, but that would be um, yeah very interesting to see. Um, again, with the with, with broader themes. So Alyssa, um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Alyssa has asked about the diffusiv the reversibility of the diffusi diffusivity abnormalities that you see. Um, do you see them? How fast do they happen? And why, if they do happen, do they happen? So in, the, in this, in this you know, small sample studies that we did, we saw that there are, um, they happen over the course of a season. Um, this is usually the time frame that we investigated preseason compared to um, postseason. Um, and that, um, as I said, in this one study, we were able to, in those American football players, we were able to investigate them after they rested and there, as I said, where most of them returned to their personal baseline. So those diffusion changes seem to be reversible. Those were young, um, as I said, college level athletes. So um, I don't know if this applies to older athletes as well, but at least in this cohort, it seems to be reversible. Great. And um, also, I think, you know, we see this in the severe field as well, that actually initially patients have increased diffusivity and, and that um, measures, and that may be to do with edema and some of that, you know, reversibility may not be a good thing necessarily. Um, so I'm going to, uh, again, combine two questions, which are sort of on touch on similar themes, again, about this idea of dose. So is there a minimum, so Arash and Mary ask, you know, is there a minimum force that is considered subconcussive. Um, he cites an American football um, a study, I think, or evidence that around 85 um, grams is, is considered average for a male to produce subconcussive force. And Mary, more in detail, asks, is there um, a sort of force that is associated with worse symptomology? So, you know, is it a continuum? Is it sort of dose response? Is there a threshold? 
yeah, very important. I wish I could give an answer to that and tell you the cutoff. Um, from our studies in soccer players, and we've also tested um, multiple acceler accelerometers, we see that most of the typical heading scenarios, they lead to accelerations about uh, 15 to 20 G, which is not much. Um, um, and that we know that some of the more long distance headers in scenarios such as during matches where you have long distance headers that could elicit up to 60 G, for example. We know that um, forces that apply to um, American football players can be even higher than that in the range of 100 uh, G. Um, and there is no clear cutoff where one where you say, okay, if you were above whatever 25, you will get a symptomatic, a symptomatic concussion. This, um, this, uh, this is probably a very individual number for every person, like when uh, someone gets a concussion. And, um, and then um, especially when you look at um, how this force applies, it also may lead to um, um, immediate symptoms or it may not lead to immediate symptoms, depending on whether you look at a male or a female or a young and an older brain. So it is very dif difficult to come up with, uh, with a range here. But um, as I said, heading is mostly in the range, I'd say under 50 G and mostly under 20 G and, um, and impacts that elicit a concussion are most likely higher. Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree with that because it's sort of individual factors, sporting factors, and as, as your you know, studies have also elegantly pointed out, it can be where exactly in the brain that injury has happened, and that might be different for different people as well. So thinking more kind of long term with the um, impact of your work, Tim asks a, a, a nice question. He was, uh, well, first of all, a lot of people have said thank you, and I've just not reported all of their thank yous. Um, but he says, what types of neurodegenerative diseases are most common? after repetitive head injury and mild TBI? Is it just certain tauopathies like CTE or do some extreme cases even get um, types of dementia? Um, again, very important question and I wished I had a straightforward answer to that, but from the studies that we, that we know so far and I pointed out the one important study from Willie Stewart and his team, we know that there is um, neurodegeneration more common in those who were former um, professional soccer players. And this study did not differentiate between different types of dementia in this, in this group. And it could also um, include a number of those having CTE, which we see from N. McKee studies on American football players. But um, most likely it is not just the case that people who are exposed to repetitive head impacts are only getting CTE but most likely there are processes that are being kicked off or triggered that then lead to the, an increased risk of developing neurodegeneration and dementia from multiple and multiple and various ways. And we also know from the neuropathology studies that oftentimes those different neuropathologies exist at the same time in the same brain, where you have signs of uh, Alzheimer's disease, for example, or Parkinson's, as well as signs of CTE. So it is not as clear cut that you get either or, you could also get a, a combination of this. But um, I think studies need to look into this more and there are currently large scale consortia funded from the NIH to look at exactly this, the long-term outcome, especially with a focus on neurodegeneration after traumatic brain injury. Super, well, thank you so much. I, I want to be respectful of your time because it's probably very late where you are now and well into the evening. Um, before I wrap up, I guess, uh, you know, based on the fantastic questions that we've had and the response to your talk, do you have any final comments on this field or, you know, last pearls of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> My final words would be, please join the effort, run uh, well-designed studies, reach out to us if you have any questions. There's so many questions that need to be answered, and I really want to excite people for the field of repetitive head impacts within the huge field of neurotrauma research, because it is important and it applies to many, many hundred million people in the world. Great. And uh, what to know to end on. Um, so thank you so much again, Professor Kurta, and thank you everybody for, for coming. And we look forward to, the, to, to your work in the future and future neurotrauma series talks. I'll do a clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs>